sounds good. All right, Ben and Suzanne, I hand it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. I think we might take a moment to introduce ourselves before we get started. Uh, my name is Suzanne Freeman. I'm a PhD candidate at MIT and Security Studies and Comparative Politics. Most of my research focuses on uh, Russian security issues and civil military relations. And Ben? Yeah, I'm also a PhD candidate at MIT along with Suzanne. Uh, I'm interested in emerging technology and the future of war. And obviously we're both super excited about wargaming as a method. Yeah, and we'd really like to thank the um, Sebastian Bay and Georgetown for the invitation to come and give this talk this evening. Um, we'd also like to thank um, our other colleagues at, at MIT that helped us run this war game, Eric Higginbotham, Dick Samuels, Eric Lynn Greenberg, and also our colleagues with the Naval Postgraduate School, Chris Twomey, who also helped us uh, with this project and the, uh, and the paper that's also attached to it. Um, so I'll get started. Um, Great. Okay. So um, our plan of the talk is that we're going to show you our research questions. Uh, for the, the war game, um, explain why we selected wargaming as an active learning tool, um, go through our learning objectives for that game, and then I'll hand it over to Ben to talk about the game design that flowed from those learning objectives and to talk about the fulfillment of those learning objectives based on a survey and interviews we did with players. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about conclusions from the game thus far and further research that we have planned. Um, last fall, we were sitting uh, up at MIT in Cambridge um, during our second semester of online learning and realizing that we were really tired of learning on Zoom. Um, virtual lectures were becoming tiresome, and even though we were excited about the material, it was just a little bit less exciting sort of day in and day out. And as the student leads of the MIT Wargaming Working Group, we partnered with our faculty advisors and our colleague of the Naval Postgraduate School to address some of these challenges. So our first question is, Sort of how should instructors proceed with the normal business of learning in an abnormal time during the pandemic? And second, um, what is the best way that instructors can bridge the divide between civilian experts, those PhD students and research fellows at MIT, and military practitioners, the students at the Naval Postgraduate School? And finally, um, how can instructors foster an active learning experience when the phrase of the day is Zoom fatigue, as we said? Um, and we know that active learning is very important for, for content retention, as I'll talk about in a moment. And so uh, we decided that the most effective tool um, would be wargaming. And so we decided to uh, partner between the MIT Wargaming Working Group and the Naval Postgraduate School to design a game to use as an active learning tool for students at the Naval Postgraduate School and MIT students and fellows. And essentially the reason why we did this is for four uh, specific uh, features of wargaming that really lend itself to being a good active learning tool. And the first of those features is its immersive potential, essentially that players can get really involved in whatever the scenario of the game is. Um, and that's partially because of the engagement potential, that it engages players emotionally, they can become really, really invested and really engaged in what they're doing, especially if the game has multiple moves. And players are having to deal with sort of the consequences of their actions, and which is, which, which is important sort of in terms of what a game is. And third, war games allow us the opportunity to explore com complex decision spaces and players can think about how they would make a decision and interact with uh, different international relations concepts as we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and finally, uh, war games provide the potential um, to consider hypothetical decision making in crisis scenarios. So potentially things like nuclear crises or issues that we haven't really seen as frequently in the real world. Um, and that because of this deep immersive potential and engagement potential, there's the opportunity to potentially approach realism, even in sort of a war game and, a, and even in the virtual environment. And for all of these reasons, we felt that wargaming would be an ideal active learning tool. And we know that active learning is really important for material retention and course performance, um, essentially because it's superior to lecture material, uh, given the way that students engage with active learning. And traditionally, you might think of active learning as sort of uh, a discussion seminar, but we thought that wargaming could come in and be an alternative way, uh, an alternative pedagogical tool. Um, so in terms of our learning objectives for what we're going to, what we're going to have is a teaching war game. The first is that we want to deepen players' understanding of major international relations ideas, particularly ideas about credibility and reputation, alliance politics and alliance dynamics, 
um, and crisis management and sort of escalation management and decision making uh, among state leaders in a crisis. In a crisis. And second, we're looking to bridge the divide between civilian and military players, because we have two different populations, sort of military officers and civilian PhD students. And then we're looking to sort of really test this idea of is wargaming an, a good active learning tool and introduce it to the students as an active learning experience. And uh, the population of players that we had, as I said, was 26 military officers from the Naval Postgraduate School and MIT military fellows. Um, and nine civilian players who are PhD students and pre and postdoctoral fellows at MIT in the political science department. And in order to measure the fulfillment of these learning objectives, we, we administered a pre and post game survey to the players to measure the fulfillment of these learning objectives, which questions with questions essentially on a five point Likert scale. And we also conducted structured interviews with players after the game. Um, and Ben will talk more about the results of those surveys in the coming slides. Sure. Well, uh, thanks to Suzanne for, for going through our learning objectives and why we chose Wargaming. I'll talk a little bit about game design uh, to start uh, and then uh, look at both the quantitative and qualitative empirical findings we had in our learning objectives. Uh, so our game design um, did flow directly from our learning objectives um, that Suzanne just outlined. Um, and furthermore, um, so we decided to use a Taiwan crisis scenario because we thought that that provided an opportunity to explore international relations ideas um, to also explore a contested environment between civilians and military, uh, and then also for an active learning experience. Uh, I know that right now Suzanne and I are talking into the, the deep void of the internet, but if we were in an environment where we could get your participation and see hands, I'm sure that a majority of participants here have probably gamed out some type of Taiwan scenario. Uh, it's not exactly a quiet topic in international relations these days. Um, instead, instead of um, getting teams to trot on the familiar ground of an invasion scenario or defense or looking at anti-access area denial, instead we went with something a little different. And particularly, we looked at a 7.9 magnitude earthquake which uh, was centered near Taiwan, which devastated Taipei and led to a Fukushima-style meltdown. Um, and this scenario was ideal for us for a variety of reasons. It put a lot of team, it put a lot of time pressure on the teams to act quickly, um, and it also led to distinct roles for both military and civilians. Um, this is obviously a scenario that has a chance of military action, given tensions between the US, China, Taiwan, and Japan, um, but is also one that prioritizes civilian decision making just as much as military planning. Um, in terms of architecture, we divided each team into two parts, civilian and military, in order to foster that learning objective of looking at bridging the civil mill divide. Um, there was a slight exception for Taiwan, um, given the distinct nature of politics on that island. We separated that team into the DPP and KMT uh, in order to more accurately mimic real life dynamics. Um, each team had separate goals um, in order to foster the contested environment, which we're trying to mimic. Um, and each player had specific roles on teams to facilitate immersion. Um, we did not try and assign players the role of a chief executive in any countries. We did not have anyone play as a President Trump or a Xi Jinping. Um, obviously our players are incapable of representing such illustrious actors themselves. But more importantly, what we really wanted to do is have teams have to come together in order to make, uh, arrive at consensus decision making. Um, and so that way we didn't want to have an executive just decide things over the teams. Um, however, we did assign specific roles not to pigeonhole players, but again, in order to try and increase um, the active learning experience and engagement. Uh, so one of the things that's really different about a war game as opposed to other types of pedagogy, and there's a lot of literature on pedagogy during the pandemic that's just been coming out over the last several months. Um, and that literature on pedagogy during the pandemic um, prioritizes clear and honest communication as being important in traditional classrooms, even more important in the online setting. What's different for us as a war game is that lines of communication, instead of being open and clear by uh, default, by being that's what you should do, instead, whether those lines of communication exist should be a deliberate choice made by the game designers in accordance with the learning objectives of the game. And because we're trying to mimic real life crisis scenarios where there's incomplete information, and because we're really trying to get at that civ mill divide, uh, what an online game allowed us to do even better than an in-person war game was perfectly capture the information flow and control the information flow as the white cell. Um, so our communications framework prioritized that white cell control. And as you can see, all lines of communication had to go with the white cell, requests for information, messages to other team, and requests for meeting other teams had to go through the white cell. Individual teams only had their own Zoom room URLs and could not access the other teams without permission from the white cell. And we limited those engagements to two per turn and only five minutes apiece, again, to cultivate an atmosphere of, mis uh, uh, of misperception. 
Additionally, um, aside from the opening 10 minutes of each turn and the final half hour of each turn, we separated the civilian and military teams um, in each of the specific cells. And this was to, again, allow for natural friction to take place between those teams. Um, and yeah, as I said, uh, the other thing that we really wanted to do for the communications framework, again, because everything during the pandemic was harder than it is in person, is we wanted to use a, like a pretty simplified architecture. We discussed various tools of communication use, but ultimately decided to use only those tools, which we were certain that every single participant was familiar with. Um, so the actual face-to-face -face and audio communication all occurred on Zoom, and all text-based communication occurred from Gmail. We set up individual Gmails for each of uh, the sub-teams, um, which allowed for a, a good record of everything to be kept, because again, everything had to flow through white cell. Um, so after talking about the game design, right now I'm going to talk about um, the fulfillment of our learning objectives um, through both our survey and interview results. Um, uh, our first learning objective to reiterate was to deepen understanding of major international relations ideas like alliance management, credibility. Um, and so uh, at the outset, we had substantial support for this informally. Um, unsurprisingly, most, most players were really enthusiastic about the game. In particular, we asked one question between the pre and post game surveys, uh, which is, I have a good understanding of the political and military factors that would affect how Taiwan crisis, crisis scenario would unfold. Uh, and you can see there that we have a super impressive p-value, so absolutely going to hang our hats on that. Um, and then in the post-game survey, um, respondents answered overwhelmingly positively to the question, I feel like I learned a lot from the crisis simulation. Um, but again, as I'm sure all of you are familiar with uh, at the Georgetown um, uh, Wargaming Group, uh, these are not necessarily like full descriptors of how a war game is. Um, most participants are overwhelmingly enthusiastic about a war game. Uh, Perla coined the idea of a bog sat, uh, which John Compton reiterated on a couple years ago in a War on the Rocks article, uh, where Compton argued, if we're honest with ourselves, it's not hard to understand how going into an intellectually stimulating environment for an extended period of time, people who have similar interests would be very gratifying personally. That's not the same thing as a successful war game. Um, Compton was particularly talking about analytical games, um, and here we're talking about learning of games. Our objectives are different. But we did want to dive beyond that surface level enthusiasm, which we kind of expected players to have. Uh, and this is where the interviews really shown through. Uh, so uh, I'll highlight here two quotes, one from a civilian player, one from a military player, about the specific types of learning that, that were accomplished. So this civilian player really highlighted the importance of attention to alliance maintenance and talked about the tensions between the US and Japan team that occurred naturally through the course of the game. In particular, what this player was referring to was the fact that with limited opportunity to interact with their teams, the US team pretty much always chose to interact with China or Taiwan and left Japan alone, which left the Japan team feeling very isolated in the context of their own alliance. Um, and this was an insight that the civilian player mentioned to us was not something uh, that they took with them going into the game, but that occurred naturally as a result of scarcity that we, was a design choice uh, in order to highlight these international relations theme. Uh, the second quote is from a military player. This military player is subsequently being posted uh, into an East Asian embassy. And this player told us that that experience from the game would follow her into her next assignment uh, in terms of understanding the nuance between how China would behave regarding the Taiwan incident. Um, and something that I really want to highlight is that this military officer told us that I think I would walk into any crisis with a lot less confidence than before this war game. Um, and I think that's maybe a little counterintuitive quote. Um, our war game led this person to be less confident. Um, but again, because the objective of the war game isn't to say this is exactly how a crisis would unfold, but instead to highlight the many complexities, nuances, um, and overlapping interactions that would muddy any response to a crisis, I think this is a really cool result that someone came from it with a lot more humility about um, understanding how something like this would unfold. So our second learning objective was bridging the divide between the civilian and military players. And for this learning objective, we're really trying to accomplish two distinct tasks. Um, the first task is we want real life civilians and officers uh, to get along without friction. Um, and this is really important. This is sort of the generalizable thing about this war game that applies even to non-security studies war games, is that hopefully what we want to do is bring together people of a lot of different backgrounds, which is a lot easier to do in an online setting, and have them all interact without separating into their own camps. Um, but also because of our subject material, we wanted in-game civilians and officers um, to experience the friction that comes from having a high stakes contest with competing civilian and military goals. Um, so we try to get at both of these things. Um, on the, uh, the second, um, we did have a question that asked in the post game survey about communication between my team and the other subnational team in my country, i.e. the civilian or military team. 
Um, and we got a pretty average response to that question, um, which seems to indicate that players um, wanted more communication between the civilian and military sub teams, just like we wanted. Um, one interesting result that we also saw in terms of the context is that players became more likely to support the delegation of civilian authority to the military after the game. So we asked this question, which statement do you agree with more in a potential Taiwan crisis, US civilian leadership in Washington need to keep tight control over the military to make sure the situation stays under the control or two needs to delegate to military commanders in theater to allow for a timely crisis response. Uh, before the game, we had close to 70% of respondents who advocated tight control. Uh, post game, only about half respondents chose tight control. Uh, we just barely missed uh, significance on our p-value, which is why I strategically chose not to display it there. Um, but I do think it's an interesting result, especially because when you only look at military respondents, unsurprisingly, they're more likely to favor delegation. Um, but in general, they move in the same way civilians do, which is playing of the game made both civilian and military respondents more likely to support delegating of civilian authority. And I think one of the cool ways that this might happen is because military players, in the absence of good communication with their civilian sub teams, wanted more freedom to act on their own authority while they were waiting for that communication. Um, so a couple, uh, again, interesting quotes from the interviews and free response. Um, throughout, players indicated that the civil dynamic of the game was more relevant than the civil dynamic of participants' real life affiliations, um, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, so from a military player, he highlighted that it was fantastic because there were no uniforms, no ranks. Uh, we had officers of a variety of ranks interact um, without worrying about what those ranks were. Um, we did have a retired admiral show up and give post-game remarks, and we decided not to include this retired admiral in any of the teams because we didn't want to test how much no uniforms, no ranks would apply, mm -hmm. but we thought it was a pretty cool result. Um, and then from a civilian player, um, this player described that the civilian side ex 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 acted as expected. They talked about jargon, authors' names, escalation dynamics, whereas the military mostly did the US military thing, tell us what you want to do and we'll give you options. And finally, the civilian player wasn't talking about real life civilians or real life military. They were talking about in-game civilians and in-game military. Uh, so finally, our last learning objective was to introduce wargaming to students as an active learning experience. And this was really important, again, in the context of having a remote learning tool um, with applications beyond just security studies. So we had three relevant questions between the pre and post game surveys that we looked at um, about whether war games are a useful tool to study important foreign policy decisions, about whether war games accurately capture information uncertainty of real life crises, and whether in-person war games have an energy and dynamic that can't be matched by a remote alternative. Um, so this graph just shows um, the difference between the pre and post game treatments. Um, you can think of this as the average treatment effect of having the war game um, where the, um, the points show the point value, there are 95% confidence intervals, and the blue and orange lines are just the difference between whether the regression includes uh, a control, uh, a dummy variable for whether the respondent was a military officer or a civilian. And so what's important there is that the blue and orange lines behave very similarly. Um, and so you can see that militaries and civilian op, um, personnel, both in general, um, saw their attitudes towards wargaming improve as a result of playing a game. Uh, respondents were more likely to say that wargaming is a useful tool for studying foreign policy and outcomes. They're more likely to say that wargaming can mimic real life crisis scenarios. And they're less likely to say that in-person war games have an energy and dynamic that can't be matched by online alternatives. Um, so throughout, we see movement in the way that we wanted to, to demonstrate that war games are a useful active learning experience, especially during the pandemic. Um, we also asked four relevant questions just in the post game. And so uh, for that first question, I was bored during a lot of the crisis simulation. Obviously, we hope no one was bored. We want a low value for that. For the other three, uh, for the other three questions, 34, 37, and 38, these are about communication, prediction, information. And what we're really hoping for is middling results where respondents were uh, generally had the information that they needed to operate, but didn't have so much information that they didn't want more. Because again, we're trying to restrict the information they get. Um, and this just shows the, the, the mean on the Likert scale of each of these response um, with a, uh, a confidence interval. Um, and again, the results are what we'd like to see for, in, um, for having Wargaming as an active learning experience, where respondents were generally um, at least somewhat frustrated by not having as much information and communication capabilities as they wanted, um, but were certainly um, not bored as we feared. Uh, and so I'll highlight, again, just a couple quotes from the interview respondents. Um, one military player highlighted the ability of war games to, to help understand possibilities. Um, they allow for actors to test theories and better understand situations. And I think this really shows how war gaming for us was accomplishing a learning objective of exploring a decision space rather than coming to a definite conclusion.
Uh, a civilian player uh, similarly talked about how war games help reveal issues that aren't immediately obvious. One of the things that we're really excited about in the war game is that a lot of the conclusions arose organically as a result from playing the game and weren't necessarily things that White Cell was like, oh, we're definitely going to teach respondents this particular thing. Um, another civilian player um, gave us a longer quote that really talks um, to how war gamings are useful for active learning. Um, and the civilian player talked about how, um, you know, when people engage emotionally with their subject and teachers, they tend to learn more. Um, and that seminars and lectures can only kind of get at this, but war games are uniquely helpful tools in this regard because it's so immersive. I mean, I know that um, even though we can't see any of you, I'm sure you're hanging on all of our words. Um, but let's be honest, right now, if we were in a war game situation where you were assigned a role, where you were in a situation that was more immersive, you're much more likely to learn and retain information than just from a, a presentation or even a debate or even from a really good Q&A session. Um, and then finally, from a military player, um, he talked about um, how as a kinetic learner, it was really helpful to have something as a war game and exercise that's a lot less static than a lot of normal classroom instruction. Um, so I think this highlights the promise of wargaming to reach people who are not going to necessarily be engaged um, by normal educational tools. Uh, and so with that, I'll pass it back on to Suzanne to, uh, to go through our conclusions. Great. So I think there are two sets of conclusions that we want to discuss, which is sort of conclusions for sort of wargaming as a pedagogy tool, wargaming in the classroom. And then conclusions sort of for wargaming in terms of bridging the gap and sort of further research that can be done with wargaming. So first of all, it really, from our results, it was very clear that virtual wargaming helped to ameliorate, ameliorate some of the challenges of online learning. Um, and then that it was this sort of really wonderful break from sort of just lecture, just discussion, that it was a way to get people more engaged with the material um, and really learning something useful. Um, and that we were sort of at least initially, although we recognize that we played sort of a smaller game and it, we did sort of only play it once, that it, and there's initial evidence that it provides a tool to bring active learning into the classroom, that it can bring sort of disparate audiences together. And that sort of one of the things that one of the players that we interviewed said was that the virtual war game offer, offers the opportunity not to need to fly somebody out to bring in different viewpoints so that we could have students in the same room who were in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and who were in Monterey, California, or for that matter, anywhere else in the country. If somebody was in Washington, DC, or somebody was in New York, um, you could bring people together for much less cost than if you all had to fly to the same place. Um, and third, that virtual wargaming was a valuable tool, we thought, um, as we continue to, as we begin to return to in-person events. Um, in a couple of weeks, uh, Ben and I will continue to help um, to run this game again at MIT with NPS. Um, and although there's more in-person learning taking place, we are once again doing the game virtually, showing that virtual wargaming can continue to be useful even as we return to in-person activity. Um, there is sort of one, one caveat to these conclusions, which is that virtual wargaming may lose some of the quieter voices in the classroom. Um, so one of the civilian players that we interviewed sort of said that withdrawn people withdraw more and outspoken players are more outspoken. Sort of the idea here is that if you're quiet, you might stay more muted on Zoom. And if you're would be more loud in the classroom, you're going to take the opportunity to sort of grab the mic and, and put in your, your view. And sort of similar to what the military players were saying, some people are muted, even if they have something good to say. In a group of multiple people, it's easier to interject in person. Online, you might be more reticent to sort of be afraid of interrupting somebody. Um, and the idea here is that um, Although there might, you may lose quieter voices in the online environment, it's unclear whether or not you would be able to bring those quieter voices um, into the game if you were in an in-person scenario. Um, but one of the things that really came out of this is that group dynamics within war games um, sort of for louder and quieter individuals are worthy of further research um, as we continue to use wargaming as a pedagogy tool and using wargaming um, for experimental or other analytic purposes. Um, and in terms of bridging the gap um, in a teaching game, the idea is bridging the gap means exposing different audiences to ideas from another professional space to create the opportunity for each group to learn from one another. And that there were sort of two distinct sort of gaps that were being bridged here. Sort of first, uh, between people who are real life military officers and people who are real life civilian PhD students. And then within the game, people who are playing military officers and people who are playing uh, civilian leadership. And you, you, you didn't necessarily end up on the side of who you were in real life. Um, and that sort of one of the civilian players said that it was helpful to get a sense of how US military officers think about these issues, 
especially because so many of the PhD students coming from MIT do study conflict and um, sort of things that have to do with military operations and planning. Um, and that some of the military players interviewed also indicated that they had meaningful exchanges with civilian academic players and stated that wargaming was helpful to bridge the gap between academic learning and the real world. Um, and so our sort of core conclusion here is that in future, future research, we should use wargaming to generate dialogue between the academic and policy world. Um, and that sort of in a teaching game or in other types of gaming like analytic experimental, there's a lot of there's a lot of purchase that could be gained here. Um, and so coming out of the game, uh, I think the two other things that we'd like to emphasize is that you know, we're working on a paper about this game, about it as a pedagogy tool. Um, and so we look forward to your feedback on this presentation and your questions. Um, and that sort of wargaming, um, although we used it sort of for a security context, you could imagine playing a war game um, in broader context as well that are not necessarily just security applications. Um, and so thank you so much for your attention. We look forward to your questions. Hey, thank you again, Suzanne and Ben for your great presentation. Uh, and you can keep up your slides just in case anyone wants to reach you on Twitter or via your emails for a little bit or for the rest of the Q&A, whichever is fine. Um, I have a couple of questions that I have for you, but as the moderator, I will um, take the prerogative as my first question is, uh, could you explain a little bit more about how you guys uh, went about designing the game itself? Sure. Um, ben, do you want to take that? Do you want me to take that? Sure, um, I can start. Um, so again, for us, it was really important that the game design flow logically from our learning objectives. Um, and so the first the first constraint we had was to try and choose a scenario that we felt like we had adequate expertise on, um, but would engage people who like hadn't who had previously studied the subject. Um, so I think one of the challenges for a war game that's trying to bring together people from disparate audiences is trying to make it accessible to people who have less information, but also interesting to people who are subject matter experts. And so when we we're going through game designs, a lot of our scenarios tilted one way or another. Um, where a lot of scenarios were like, okay, this game is going to be great if you come in with like operational knowledge of like Taiwanese air defenses. And if you don't have that knowledge, you're going to be really bored to tears of this game. Um, or conversely, we had games where there was going to be very low chance of military interaction happening at all. Um, and we didn't want a game where military officers thought, well, I don't have a role here. This is just the civilians talking and I'm just sitting here on my, my hands twiddling my thumbs. And so for us, that led to trying to come up with something unique about Taiwan, which led to the Fukushima style meltdown. Um, beyond that, in terms of the choice of scenario, um, we did want to increase time pressure to make sure that uh, if something happened. One of the fears for any war game is actually that there, there will be a lack of conflict. Uh, and so that's one of the things that the White Cell team talked about is like how to, to create inserts to make sure that conflict kept going, like how to foil the best laid plans of teams. And here again, it was really useful to keep in mind that we were running a learning game whose goal was engagement and exploring these things, not trying to do a most likely scenario or trying to arrive at a certain analytical outcome. And so that gave the white cell a lot of freedom um, to, uh, for lack of a better term, mess with things in order to stir up action. Um, after the first turn, um, our, our US and Japan teams are being fairly reticent. Um, and so the white cell decided they were going to punish them by trying to have like a worst case scenario for their move orders in order to create a lot more pressure on them to act in terms two and three. Um, I, I think that was particularly about um, the, the scenario. I'm happy to answer uh, if you were curious about other aspects of game design, also um, what yeah. you want to contribute. Um, I think the other thing that I would emphasize is that sort of we did a multi move game sort of in, in the way to sort of facilitate that immersion. So three moves so that what you do the first move, you have to deal with the second move, and what you do the second move, you have to deal with the third move, um, rather than just sort of a, a one and done type uh, type structure for the for the game. Yeah, that's we also that's a good point because we did debate how many moves to add, where um, we wanted to at least like have some progression over time for immersion, uh, but we worried that if we went far beyond move three, we'd actually have to worry about operational military planning. Um, and again, that was that was just going to be too complex for us to do with the Zoom architecture and to, to appeal to everyone. So on that note, I would like to ask, um, what did the players submit to you guys in terms of the white cell? Were there any things they had to submit in terms of uh, communiques or requests, or did you have a pen, uh, template, or how did they interact with your game beyond just requests for meetings? Yeah, so I can take that, uh, and then Ben can add on. 
Uh, so first they had to submit move orders via email at the end of each turn, sort of they have to do it sort of on time or if move doesn't happen. Um, so those are military moves, diplomatic moves, um, and sort of any other type of sort of humanitarian moves given sort of the, the humanitarian crisis nature of uh, the nuclear style crisis. Um, and they could also submit sort of a press release if they wanted something sent to another team. Um, and then sort of in between moves, um, the white cell was adjudicating the result of the interaction between the different teams moves that were submitted. And then at the beginning of each of each move presenting to the teams sort of the situation at, the, at that time based on their previous moves. Yeah, and I think the important thing from, from what Suzanne said is we really didn't want to, because there's a trade-off um, between the amount of freedom you give players and the amount of detail that you can expect. Um, so at one end of the spectrum, you can have games where you require like very specific move orders from players. And that's a lot easier to constrain what goes on in the game and make it more accurate to real life dynamics. And I think it's more appropriate if you're running a more analytic type game. Um, for us as a learning game, we really didn't want to constrain the ideas that players had or what they could do. And so as Suzanne said, we had move orders that were required at the end of each turn that encompassed a wide variety of things that happened on that turn. Um, and specifically, we broke that down into categories of military, diplomatic, uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, and others. Um, but we really, like, these were templates, um, uh, these were guidelines more than hard and fast rules. Um, because we wanted players to be able to, to come up with um, any idea that they thought of and, and feel like if it was if it was debated and won approval on the team, they could talk about it to White Cell. Um, and to be clear, in terms of our game design, we had to build in very long adjudication periods between rounds. The game occurred over multiple days because we knew in advance that White Cell would need a long amount of time to adjudicate um, a much more open move orders than a quick adjudication that can happen if moon orders are more constrained in what players can do or not. I think part of the other piece that we're trying to simulate here is that at the beginning of the game of the of the move, because the civilian and military parts of the team are together, sort of there's that offer, there's that opportunity for the civilian players to give commanders guidance and then separate out into sort of civilian and military, the military portion of the team continues to plan to make those sort of military part of the move that they'll submit as a group. The civilian players continue the diplomatic move and then sort of they come back together at the end to put that move back together to submit to White Cell. And they did sort of have an order of battle, an order of battle available to them of sort of military equipment or um, other types of equipment that was available for them to use within the crisis. To sort of follow up on, uh, on a question about execution of the game is uh, someone wants to ask, the white cell seems to have to be at least a few people to manage all this coordination and data flow. How did the members of the white cell ensure they were all synchronized and coordinated with each other while also coordinating with four teams? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we spent a lot of time ahead of the game planning how to synchronize and coordinate. Um, so I think one of the reasons why our acknowledgements at the beginning of the talk were so long is because there is a large group of people um, behind this game. It's not just Ben and myself. Um, we had six or seven other members of the white team. So each, each game cell, the Zoom room has sort of a white cell person who's administering the cell and then um, sort of a meeting room if the two teams want to meet also has a white person in that cell and then each of oh yes that's a good idea show the architecture again um, and then white cell has sort of four or five people within it who are responding to players um, and beginning to think about adjudication um, for the move and sort of responding to those rfis responding to questions teams have sending uh information from one team to the other I think um, in our presentation, we highlighted how you have to have an art architecture figured out ahead of time for a remote game. Um, but I do think it's equally important to be able to adapt. Um, and so you're, um, the question is correct that it requires a large amount of, uh, of workforce on the white cell. You can't, this game doesn't really want, uh, wouldn't run or wouldn't be possible to run it if you only had a few people in the white cell. Because as Suzanne mentioned, you had to have a host for every single room, including the two meeting rooms. And then you have to have a bunch of people in white cell actually adjudicating the moves and responding to the request for information. Um, I think that's something that anyone who's run a war game can empathize with. The teams always want more information than you give them. So half the time it's just white cell figuring out um, how to manage all this. And so originally we had um, teams try and establish meetings with other teams also by emailing the white cell through the Gmail. And this was just causing a huge bottleneck at the white cell. So eventually we deconflicted that um, by having the white, like the, the room hosts in each of the rooms um, communicate with each other offline or via text message or, or hopping into other Zoom rooms in order to reduce the bottleneck at white. 
Um, so it, it just does highlight the importance of being able to adapt the game um, as the actual thing unfolds, because you're not going to be able to predict everything that happens in a game, especially one that allows for as much open player choice as this one did. So another great comment slash question was, how do you, how did you select your players given the importance of sort of experience, but also organizational culture and how both the civilian and uniform side react to certain crises? Yeah, and that's a really interesting question, especially with any, with any sort of civil military dynamic to think about those organizational culture issues. Um, in terms of player selection, um, some of this sort of was sort of part of it was a sort of a convenience sample of players that there was a group of students at NPS who were taking a class um, with one of the members of the white cell. Um, and so all of his students as part of the class played the game. Um, and so they'd been taking a class that was on East Asian politics that semester. So they did sort of have sub some subject matter expertise coming in. I um, mean, most of them were military officers. So they also had sort of that type of expertise coming in. And then in terms of the civilian players from MIT, we have sort of a community of interest at MIT. That's the Wargaming Working Group um, that we've been running for about a year and a half prior to playing the game, who are familiar with Wargaming as a tool, but we're also conducting their own academic research, some of East Asia, but many of it on sort of military operations, nuclear issues, um, other types of security, security issues, who all sort of have the type of expertise and interest in the game. Would you add anything, Ben? Oh, no, I think that's, um, that's the answer. I think you're right. It is difficult. Uh, the question asker is right that it can be difficult to juggle this. In our case, it was helpful that the member of the white cell who ran the MPS class was able to identify interests and abilities of the MPS students. And as Suzanne mentioned, um, for the MIT students, we were able to solicit interests. I think the really important thing is, again, um, uh, to, to continue beating this dead horse. Everything has to flow from your overall objectives. And again, for us, because the civ mill divide was so interesting, bridging that divide was so interesting, I think more important than any type of expertise was just making sure that our teams were balanced between the civilian players and the military players as best we could make it. And we didn't want any of the sub teams to be only civilians or only military members. So that's a great transition to another question. Uh, could you could you please explain the different objectives that the civilian and military players on a single team were assigned? I'm curious about how you calibrated the objectives to cause tension within the team while simultaneously providing a somewhat unified objective for the entire, quote, country. Yeah, I think this is also this is also sort of making making team objectives sort of can really either sort of create a game that's dead in the water or create a game that really starts to move forward. Um, and this is sort of something we were talking about recently as we're about to run the game again. Um, and in terms of sort of what those actual objectives are, I might hand it over to Ben. Yeah, I think so. I think it's it's pretty clear to see, like especially for Taiwan, how the DPP and KMT, um, their, their preferences diverge. Um, I think this question is insightful just in the sense of preparing for the game we're about to run. We're still actually juggling the question of how properly to calibrate it. So there are divergent perspectives that aren't unreasonable. Um, you know, it's not like uh, for the uh, U.S. military team or like your objective is to launch a coup and take power in the United States. I don't think we get a lot of buy-in from our players there. We have a very interesting game. Um, but one of the, of the divergent objectives that's intrinsic to the game design um, is that the military team wants to stay relevant. And I think that this is one of those attentions between U.S. and civil or between civilians and militaries, even in the U.S. or other healthy democracies that often goes understated in the literature, where in a Taiwan scenario, from a purely national perspective issue, perhaps military options are not the best way to deal with the crisis. But when you separate teams into the military team and give the military team ownership over certain issues, they are going to prioritize maintaining that ownership and maintaining the relevance, even when perhaps their participation is less than helpful. Um, so for both the um, US military team and the China military team, um, their actions could occasionally escalate the crisis because they wanted to use military hardware, they wanted to use military service members, and they wanted to use military assets in order to show that the military was relevant in a humanitarian assistance and disaster relief mission. And the use of those assets often caused misperceptions with the other teams about the actual type of intention of the other side. Um, and so I think that's probably the chief way in which those goals diverge because the military wants to show that it's an important player um, even in crises that are not necessarily military major, major, but only have the potential for kinetic action. I think especially also because the way that the game architecture was set up, 
military teams were able to meet mill to mill in addition to civilian teams being able to meet civilian to civilian. So sort of the civilian teams could have two team could have two meetings with another team per per turn and military teams could have one meeting with another team per turn. So they were sort of able to go out and have sort of a mill to mill communication that might result in some type of of planning uh, later in the move. So another question is says it is quite easy to understand the wrong lessons or negative learning from a war game. For example, because of the weaknesses in the game model or adjudication, or because of idiosyncratic player behavior, or because players don't have full visibility of the game, how do you suggest we might mitigate this risk in your game or other educational games? Yeah, I think sometimes sort of the, the way that this issue is often discussed in other types of analytic games is that the concern is people will come to sort of policy conclusions based on something that happens in the game. And really that was a result of the game design. But here, because the goal really is learning, um, the, idea, the idea is really for them to be able to explore a larger decision space, whether it sort of be these alliance dynamics um, or sort of issues with credibility in terms of decision-making. And one of the things that we did sort of at the conclusion of the game was have sort of a large plenary session um, where we allowed players in the white cell to get together to sort of talk about the types of issues that we had uh, during the game and sort of what their impressions were and what our impressions were to sort of try to pull back the curtain so that they might see things from a broader perspective than they did sort of during the game and sort of bring it back to sort of a more seminar style discussion in a classroom. I think Suzanne makes a really good point there where it, it depends a lot on what the objectives are. And especially, I think one of the things that a lot of war game practitioners can get upset with is when people think that war games can offer like a definitive answer to a policy question, especially a single iteration of a game that only really tells you about its assumptions. Um, so when I worked at, uh, when both uh, Sebastian and myself were at RAND, we participated in a couple war games um, where people's results at the end of it were like, well, uh, you know, I really want to favor this policy decision, but that only happened because player X played badly in this scenario. And so, yes, if you're trying to determine the effect of a piece of emerging technology or a particular military strategy or trying to, you know, game out like how quickly could um, Russia take over capitals of the Baltic countries, you need to run multiple iterations of a game and really conduct a lot of sensitivity analysis to determine um, where your conclusions are coming from, whether they're artifacts of the game design or are coming from arbitrary decisions made by players. Um, and you need to be able to like have a very careful explanation of like where that analysis and decision-making power comes from. In the same way that if you're running a, a journal article with quantitative results, you're gonna be expected to have performed a sensitivity analysis on your regression or whatever tool you're using in order to show what's driving where your results are coming from. For our war game, because it, as Suzanne mentioned, it was a learning game, we're much more open to the actual goal of this being, um, wow, that was an insight I didn't come up with. Maybe that put tank, maybe that insight becomes from a team playing unexpectedly that wouldn't happen if you re-ran the game. Um, but I think that's one of the things we're really excited to run this game again in the coming weeks, and hopefully this will become an annual game um, where we can look at uh, ideas over time and try and maybe smooth away some of the results that come only from idiosyncratic behavior. Um, Unfortunately, I think it's a great question, but I don't think there's an easy answer to it. I think mainly it comes from iterations um, and tightly controlling how you're in, um, what you're actually getting based on the game designs you have for the game or the uh, learning objectives you have for the game. The next question asks, could you speculate about the consequences of civilian military asymmetries in a group composition? Do you believe the lessons you have drawn from this game would have a, have different uh, results or if it if the civilian to military ratio in your player pool were more balanced or in, uh, uh, or more tilted towards one direction or to another? Yeah, so I think that, I think maybe what the player is thinking about is sort of the number of players who are coming from a military background, the number of players who are coming from a civilian background. So obviously the majority of our players were coming from a military background, even if they are playing civilian positions during the game. Um, and that sort of would our results have been different if we had had sort of 50% military officers and 50% civilians. I think maybe that's one of the issues that comes from sort of a convenient sample of players and that it certainly would be ideal in future iterations of the game to have a more even distribution of military players and civilian players. But I think one of the things um, that does sort of help to alleviate this concern is one of the slides that Ben showed earlier showing that 
um, sort of the views of civilian players and military players before and after the game were moving in similar ways. That it wasn't as though um, military players had sort of a divergent, different uh, experience in the game than civilian players had. Um, but it's certainly sort of almost a sort of this game within the game of sort of who are you really versus who are you playing in the game. It would be interesting sort of to get a more even distribution of players. I also think it's one of the things that Suzanne highlighted in conclusion is important because I think in any war game, online or in person, you have to be careful about losing the quieter voices. And sometimes voices are quiet because um, they're in the minority in terms of representation. I think for us in the game, for the civilian military divide, I wasn't too worried about our civilian players being outnumbered because most of them were PhD students who are typically not known as a, as a shy group, especially in the context of a war game. Um, so I think in terms of uh, pound for pound, they're much more likely to make their voice heard. Um, I think one of the areas where our war game suffered and a lot of war games suffered is we didn't have a particularly good gender ratio. Um, and I think in general, it's harder for um, women and minorities in order to like have better representation in order not to always be some of the quiet voices in the game. Um, but I think that's a really good question in terms of like making sure when you like compose your group, like how you have representation in order to make sure everyone feels comfortable talking. So on that note, uh, you mentioned that you guys are going to do a, another iteration of this or a different game? Um, another iteration. So as you guys are going to the next iteration, what are things you are you guys are changing in terms of player selection, design, or execution uh, moving forward from lessons learned from the first one? So uh, one of the things that we're um, that we are hoping we didn't get nailed on with the question in this presentation is that we didn't necessarily have um, the the most questions in our survey about the actual central issue, the Civ Mill questions. Um, so just to go to um, this slide, you can tell that like we had some questions that got at the Civ Mill dynamic, but we didn't feel entirely comfortable with how many empirics we were getting. Um, so one of the differences is we're adding two more questions to our survey um, about uh, in a potential crisis involving Taiwan, military leaders should defer to civilian leaders on strategic planning. And in a potential crisis involving Taiwan, there would be substantial friction between US civilian and military leaders that would impede the US response. And we're hoping that both of these questions can get a little more closely at the Civ Mill dynamics um, that we're trying to tease out. Um, so that's one way we're changing it. Yeah, I think um, one of the other sort of ways that we're changing it is sort of just the way in which white cell works in order to try to streamline some of those pieces, sort of some things that we learned from playing the game last year. Um, and then sort of other changes. Um, well, in terms of the player selection, um, I think one of the difficulties for wargaming in general, especially as grad students with uh, extremely limited research budgets, is that you're sort of confined to samples of convenience. I think this is a really interesting um, arena for potentially doing like entirely like virtual games, like the like the signal games in terms of getting a much larger in. Um, but for us, we're still constrained to convenience samples. One of the things that's different about this year is that Eric Higginbotham and Dick Samuels at MIT are also teaching a class on wargaming. So in addition to getting participants from the NPS class and from the MIT Wargaming Working Group, we're also getting participants from that class. Um, again, it would be, it'd be wonderful in order to select a more representative sample instead of who happens to be taking these classes. Um, but it is nice to have a slightly larger player pool this year, hopefully. Um, but one of the pieces about sort of continuing to use virtual wargaming instead of in-person wargaming is that it can allow you to run more iterations without having to fly large groups of people to the same place. Yeah, I mean, at this point, um, uh, we're able to meet in person for all of our MIT events, which is great. It's great not to have to do everything through Zoom anymore. Um, but for this, it, it would just be completely unfeasible in order to have this game. And uh, in one of our recent meetings, I asked uh, our NPS representative, is like, hey, could we have done this game without Zoom, without the pandemic? And he just said, no, it never would have happened. Um, so this really, as Suzanne mentioned, is like a really cool thing that, that online uh, remote capabilities have given us. So the next question asks, Wargaming encompasses such a large area of operations from RPGs, competitive war games, cooperative war games, and digital war games, to name a few. How best to include all these communities for the future and not just channel a single community in terms of uh, players or the tools you use? Yeah, so I think that we've thought um, in sort of the MIT Wargaming Working Group more broadly, sort of outside of this game, about trying to sort of sort of 
uh, get exposure to each of these particular types of games and part, types of communities. And I know that it's something that um, Dick Samuels and Eric Higginbotham also sort of look at in their class sort of with different types of gaming. Um, and that we really focus sort of in the first year of that particular group at sort of political military games and operational war gaming, um, sort of analytic games. But we did also sort of have some experience with experimental games um, because Jackie Schneider, Ben Schechter, and Rachel Schaefer um, sort of came and did an iteration of their uh, international crisis war game at MIT. Um, and then also, I believe that we had a we had a meeting also with Andrew Reddy, who sort of works on the Signal game to sort of have exposure to that particular game. But one of the things that we are doing with that MIT group is really trying to generate a larger community of interest at MIT. It seems like in some of the same way that you are at Georgetown. Um, and the idea would be that we're, we would like to continue to bring in sort of other speakers to sort of uh, expose people to the different communities of gaming. I think that's, that's probably the most important thing is just when you have more players, you can experiment with different types of games. It would be wonderful to do a series of experimental games on like particular research questions that members of the War Game Working Group had. Um, it would also be great to get back to operational war gaming. Um, we ran a couple series of the next war games when we were in person before the pandemic. Um, and I think largely the big constraint is player pool. And then also making sure that the objective of your war game um, is, uh, is, is going to be constrained by the medium in which you're operating. I think it's easier to do a Paul Mill crisis simulation on Zoom than it would be to do like an in-depth operational game. Um, but it has been fun to, to listen to all the speakers that Suzanne talked about. And I'm sure at some point in the future, we'll try and um, uh, get Sebastian to give us all your emails so we can invite you to, to, to join some of our experimental games if we ever get that ball rolling. And we hope that you'll come and play. <laughs> I'll sell that email list to you guys. You know what I mean? Um, like $5 per email or something. Um, <laughs> uh, because I mean, we all know PhD candidates are rolling in dough. Um, <laughs> All right, so the next question is, I know the purpose of the game was to look at the mill uh, sieve divide, but could you have mass the demographics and structured the questions as agnostic to a particular group, then look at the results and see how they might have confirmed your results? Um, so I think sort of the first thing that I would say to that question is that one of the things that we did want to do in the surveys was really try to protect the anonymity of the players. Um, so is sort of in the hopes that they would sort of be honest in the survey, but also because we recognize sort of in human subject research, which is sort of part of what a war game like this is, um, that you don't want to have any sort of adverse impact from having played the game or participated in the survey. And so we collected very little demographic information about players for that reason, um, partially because of the small size of the players, sort of, right? If you, if you collect information about sort of who's a PhD student and a woman, well, then maybe there's only two people if that could be. Um, or sort of if you about sort of are you an Air Force officer um, and sort of a man, well, maybe then there's only three people it could be given sort of the size of the player pool. Um, so really the only demographic information that we collected from players were sort of is your background military or civilian, which does sort of limit sort of the power of what we can do with our results. But we think that the trade off there in terms of sort of research ethics really made a lot of sense. Yeah, on that point, it would have been great if we could assign people like a particular identifier to have between the pre and post game surveys, which would have greatly increased the power of our results, maybe get a couple more of those uh, starred p values and maybe we could have published in a better journal that would have been great and all. Um, but the issue with that again is, is it identifiability so we were constrained with that. Um, I will take this opportunity to deliberately misunderstand the question um, to answer something that I think would be cool in terms of like looking at divides outside Civ Mill. So I think for us, Civ Mill was a really natural thing because we were working with the NPS group and MIT group, and then it led naturally to be include both as a meta thing um, outside the game and as an issue within the game. Um, but I do think one of the things that we're really excited about from this is hopefully um, trying to talk and uh, excited about the paper is hopefully trying to um, communicate wargaming as a tool to audiences that aren't traditionally familiar with wargaming. And I think there is a lot of potential. Um, I think uh, the, the Washington Post highlighted a series of games that they ran um, around the 2020 election in the United States about how that election could go and how to transfer power and all that. And trying to highlight this as an example of like, yeah, you can use war gamings on a wide variety of things, not just the Civ Mill divide, in order to bring together people with a lot of different expertise um, would be a really cool conclusion for our paper to like bring to a wider audience. Um, so hopefully we can do it not just with, with Civ Mill as the primary divide.
So another question slash comment is, uh, when I researched for the purpose of creating a war game, I actively noticed that my research approach was markedly different from how I would have otherwise gone about researching the same topic. It ended up changing my own long-held beliefs regarding the subject matter, uh, matter issue. Uh, I'm curious to know what your experience was in creating this game, and if, if you had a similar experience or a markedly different one. Well, first, I'd like to, to thank the person who gave that question for, for highlighting the, the chief benefit of war games we're trying to get to, um, which is that, yeah, by forcing yourself to encounter a certain perspective and really immersing yourself, you're going to get to conclusions that you just, you absolutely could not have achieved by a different way. Um, so hopefully that we'll, um, we'll, we'll steal that and, and make that part of the paper. Um, I think that in particular for this game, uh, one of the things that I was really surprised by is Japan's behavior during the course of the game. I think that uh, as an American who's occasionally looked at this issue, I have a very US centric perspective, especially when it comes to Japan, where it's just like, oh, you know, Japan wants to balance against the threat of China. They're only reliable external offshore balancers, the United States. Um, their constitutional military structure, it, you know, involves the United States in these decision makings. It's like they're clearly there to be a supportive ally who doesn't really have a lot of room to maneuver outside of the US. And in this game, having players have a particularly Japanese perspective with their own goals for the game highlighted the areas in which there are a lot of frictions between what Japan wants to accomplish and what the United States wants to accomplish, and not in a purely linear fashion. Like sometimes Japan wanted more robust military response, sometimes it wanted a less robust military response in a way that would have been really impossible for me to predict before the game. Um, so that's something where I felt like, it, like I definitely, I won't say like experienced a eureka movement, um, but um, definitely changed some of my like assumptions that I hadn't really realized that I'd had about the game design. I think what I would add is that sort of, obviously Taiwan is sort of in a very special situation and that given that this sort of game had a humanitarian disaster relief element to it, it was interesting uh, for me to see the amount to which sort of that disaster relief really became politicized in the way that teams were dealing with it. And partially that could be an artifact of the game and the fact that um, sort of players were given sort of an order of battle. They're sort of told that they're civilian and military players. Maybe they want to try and solve the crisis in that way. Um, but sort of there was a lot of concern of, well, is, is Taiwan sort of being identified as an individual country here? Is that, is that sort of a negative aspect uh, sort of in between like the US and China's relationship within the game? Um, and, you know, I think I think a lot about Russian security issues. And so my experience sort of with East Asia was probably the weakest coming into the game. And so I certainly learned a lot. But I was much more familiar with the method of wargaming um, than sort of the political dynamics within the region. So going back to some of the design questions I have is what kind of expertise was consulted or method uh, for your adjudication process to judge or um, Get, provide feedback to the uh, player actions and their teams? Well, um, like I may have mentioned earlier, one of the fun things about how this game de de developed is that our adjudication wasn't built around the most likely response. Um, and so in those types of games, it's you absolutely have to have the best subject matter experts because as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, there is nothing people who play war games like to do more than fight the white cell over adjudication. Um, and lead to long and very non-productive debates. And then it's very helpful to have a white cell subject matter expert come in and say, no, this is the most likely for this particular reason, or we're following this like pre-established game rubric. In our game, our adjudication was deliberately designed in order to make the game more interesting to players and to highlight more of the international relations themes that we really wanted them to discuss. That being said, um, we were lucky to have a lot of subject matter expertise. Um, uh, both Dick Samuels and Eric Higginbotham are longtime Japan experts, Chris Toomey, was teaching the class on PRC relations. Um, Eric Wayne Greenberg, our other faculty advisor, has also conducted a lot of research into this area. And so um, because of the online situation, we needed a large white cell composed of those players and then also uh, the four PhD students who ran the rooms. Um, and because we had such a large pool of potential players and expertise, it led to pretty interesting discussions during adjudication. Um, and although this is obviously not something that was a player experience, one of the most fun things to me as someone who is in the white cell was just participating in these long back and forth about what's most likely, what's reasonable, what will players buy, what will players fight against um, because of the wide variety of differing expertise that happened in the actual control room. But, but most importantly, sort of coming back to the goal of this as a teaching game, sort of what adjudication outcome while being reasonable 
will lead players sort of into, the, into exploring the types of dynamics that we want them to be exploring within the game. Um, but I think sort of as opposed to other war games where there might be sort of more rigid adjudication tables or tools, this was a much less structured adjudication process sort of with an eye towards this is a teaching game. We're like hoping that the, that the students that are playing are really having sort of an active learning experience. So Ben and Suzanne, can you speak to some of the meta game constraints and factors that affected your games? For instance, did the players have any incentive, uh, i.e. grades or uh, extra credit to actively pursue their specific goals or any other things that you think could have uh, affected your gameplay? Um, well, I think sort of at, at the time of the first game, Ben and I were both sort of uh, in coursework ourselves. So I don't think that we wanted to wish sort of uh, creating a stressful environment, given sort of the, the stress of being in class during the pandemic online. Um, so certainly for the PhD students involved, I don't think that there was any sort of grade structured piece. Um, and, but I'm sort of, in terms of the NPS portion, um, I'm not actually sure, but I don't think so. So, so as I understand it, um, on the PhD side, we all just did it for the love of the game. Um, and the, the, the really, the thing about online games that's much worse than in-person games is you can't even get the uh, institute provided pizza. Um, so we had to do it in our own separate homes and, and not have that lifeline uh, as good PhD students need. Um, on the MPS side, I do know that the participation was mandatory and that it was part of the class, but your grade was not affected. Like there was no like performance review of how players did in the game or how often they participated. Um, the surveys were purely voluntary. Um, that said, we had very high military participation because unsurprisingly, uh, when uh, the instructor of military officers say, hey, take the survey, almost all the military officers did in fact take the survey, even in the absence of actual consequences for it. Um, in terms of meta constraints, I think the more important things were one, you know, having to choose issue areas that satisfied um, uh, what the, the class at NPS was going, which was about East Asian security. So that helped inform our, like, where we located our, our, our scenario. Um, but then the more uh, pressing meta constraints for an online game are finding a way to have enough time to actually run a successful war game while also trying to minimize burnout that happened throughout days. And so war games always take longer than you think they will. There are always going to be unexplained delays. Um, and they're always like, you're, especially for this game, as we mentioned before, you're going to need a lot of time for adjudication. Um, but just trying to schedule a game where it happened in a compressed timeline, not like months or weeks apart, um, but also do it so that we didn't take up too much of people's time because we knew that if you're on hour eight of a Zoom call, it doesn't matter how cool the subject material is, you're just not going to be paying as much attention. Um, so I think those were bigger constraints that we faced. Right. I think that research shows that after about 20 or 30 minutes on Zoom, you've probably zoned out. Um, well, so I hope that none of you have zoned out <laughs> given that. I uh, definitely zoned out 40 minutes ago. <laughs> but um, I think the other thing that I would add there is that one of the major differences between this iteration of the game that we're doing this year and what we did last year is that last year we sort of did the game over a two day period that was much more compressed where sort of turns were back to back and there was less time for adjudication. This time we're doing the game over sort of three separate days where there's multiple days in between each turn. Um, and so that will be sort of a very different structurally um, for the game sort of allowing more time for adjudication, but also potentially less time for players to burn out um, in between turns. So on that note, could you walk us through what uh, a turn looked like for your game in terms of time, actions, and how you guys uh, execute the game? Sure. So I think I'll sort of speak to what we did sort of in the iteration that we're presenting and not so much to the, what we're going to do this time. Um, but essentially the way that it worked from my recollection is that the sort of there's an update potentially from the white cell at the beginning of the turn sort of if it's a turn where there was a previously a move if it's not just sort of the initial crisis turn. Um, and then sort of at the beginning there's about 10 or 20 minutes together with sort of both halves of the civilian side and the military side or for the Taiwan team sort of the two different political parties together. And then the two teams would be separated out into sort of two different breakout rooms for sort of the next. 40 minutes, about an hour, yeah. about an hour. Um, and then they would come back together for the final 40 minutes of the turn. 
Um, and sort of during that time period, they would be able to have meetings with other teams, sort of organized through White Cell, communicate with White Cell. And then at the final portion of the term, and at the end of the term, they have to submit their move order via email. Uh, yes, in terms of like some of the specifics that happen during a term, um, and a, a lot of times, I think sometimes it seems like, oh, 10 minutes is a long time. 10 minutes is not a long time when there are 12 people who all want to talk about their own specific viewpoints and what they think about um, an issue. And particularly what would happen is the white cell would either give the first turn order or give the adjudication from the last turn. And then there'd be an immediate deluge of people who wanted to request information from the white cell about what does this specific thing mean? How did this move order last turn get, get updated? Um, and then in that 10 minutes at the beginning while those RFIs are being processed, teams would also have to come together to come up with a coherent national strategy. Um, I was in the Taiwan room. So instead of the civ mill divide, uh, the first 10 minutes were sort of a thin veneer of cooperation uh, between the two Taiwanese political parties. And then they split into breakout rooms and, and plotted against each other the entire time. Um, and so those conversations after the initial request for RFIs, a lot of the team turned into, okay, we have to meet with this group to see what they are. We have to clarify with this group to see what they're doing. Um, and so most of those, most of the turn was a mad scramble for information. Now in the final 30 to 40 minutes, teams would actually be forced to come up with their move orders. And this is where the big debates of the war game would happen, where people are like, okay, if we advocate an emergency response here or put troops on the island here or allow landing of forces here, like how are other teams gonna interact? Um, and so even though the turns were quite long, at the end, there was a big compression because um, teams would really get fierce, would fiercely debate a lot of these issues when they're actually coming up with the move orders. Um, although uh, as much as it's it's fun to explain this, I really do think that in terms of to get an understanding, you sort of have to be um, in a game like this um, to, to get a feeling for like how mad that scramble at the end can be. So another question is, at the cost of sounding uh, philosophical, do you think it is possible for a game designer to to contrive a scenario and gameplay in a particular way in order to consciously shape, change, or reinforce a player's opinion on a subject matter? Uh, if yes, what are the implications of the same? Uh, one, please don't apologize for philosophical questions. You know, we got enough time. Happy to happy to to beat those out. You know, and theory is a subfield in political science, so philosophy is good. Yeah, I mean, not one that we do, but still. <laughs> Um, in terms of the specific question, I think it's absolutely possible for a game design to lead naturally to a certain conclusion. And I think that these are a subset of learning games called teaching games, where the objective is to make sure your players have a particular experience so they all come away with the same conclusion. Um, when I was at RANS, um, I helped uh, with a team that made uh, hegemony, um, and they styled that as hegemony, um, where the entire point was to have US policy practitioners play a game where the US could not do any, cannot do everything. Um, there were trade-offs between readiness and future research. There were trade-offs between where the US was deployed. Um, the US could never fully address everything that potential adversaries were doing. Uh, and the game was not designed to be a picture-perfect replication of the challenges the United States is facing. The game, as I understand it, was designed to teach its players that fundamental truth that US resources are limited and they're not sufficient to meet every single possible national security objective. A point which may seem obvious to us, but it's not always necessarily acted upon within the national security community. Um, so that's just one example of a game that I happen to participate with. Um, but teaching games are, are a subset of games and absolutely possible to do that. But, but I think sort of here, it's not as though there were sort of five specific points we wanted players to learn from the game. It was sort of that we wanted them sort of be immersed in this decision space to sort of think about alliance dynamics and think about sort of the complexity of a crisis like this and sort of think about Taiwan special status and think about um, sort of a different type of Taiwan crisis than sort of a military crisis that people might be more used to thinking about. So another question from the audience is, what future war games are you planning for 2022? That's wow. That's a great question. Wish we uh, wish we had more more specific games planned. Um, I think that after after this game, um, we're really excited to get back to being able to do in person stuff. So it would be fun to return to more operational games. Um, in terms of experimental war games, um, this is not something that's planned. But um, 
uh, it'd be really fun to, uh, or at least I, I had an idea for a war game that would specifically test the number of people involved in a nuclear command and decision making uh, procedure um, as whether it determined or whether that affects the likelihood of nuclear use in games. And more broadly, I think one of the things that's just sort of accepted as random in war games is representing a unitary actor like a specific leader with a team or a group of individuals. And I'm curious in the ways that group decision making and individual decision making are different. Um, and because that game is getting at a, like a particular type of research question, uh, instead of having a learning game like ours, it would be more appropriate for an experimental methodology. Um, that being said, I just babbled a lot about ideas I have. This is not a specific plan. It'd be wonderful to get the resources in order to act upon stuff like that. Um, but I don't have anything particularly in the pipe. But I think with sort of with respect to sort of the larger MIT Wargaming Working Group, so sort if of it is a place where graduate students can come sort of with research designs for games, um, that sort of we hope to help sort of people facilitate those games and make them better before they sort of uh, play them in addition to playing games together as a group, whether they be operational, political, military, uh, sort of analytic games or experimental games. So on that note, that's a great transition to ask about the MIT Wargaming Group. Uh, could you share more about it for those who are new to hearing about it for the first time? Yeah, um, so I think the MIT Wargaming Working Group was sort of came out of uh, Ben and I's first semester at MIT, uh, Eric Higginbotham um, and Dick Samuels were teaching their wargaming class at that point. Um, and Ben and I had both had experience with wargaming um, in our prior careers before the PhD program, sort of Ben at Rand and me at the Naval War College, um, sort of in terms of operational wargaming. Um, and sort of we were like, oh man, it would have been really nice to take that class. And sort of we found a lot of our cohort mates were similarly very interested in using um, wargaming as a method within uh, political science research. And so um, we realized there was a lot of interest within the program, and so we sort of started this working group to try to give people a place to both sort of learn more about the method, but also play games together and sort of engage with the broader community of uh, people who work in wargaming, um, sort of either in academia or in policy. Um, and so sort of this group is still very actively growing, um, but sort of continues to have engagement sort of as new students join the program and as new research fellows join the program. I, um... Just as Suzanne was was very polite in saying it, but yes, the MIT Wargaming Working Group arose because of a grudge over a scheduling snafu. Um, so we were just upset and we wanted to, to, to learn more about wargaming. I think wargaming as a methodology um, is in a particular spot right now in political science, where I think a lot of established researchers are somewhat skeptical of its utility. A lot of the questions tonight have gotten at the issues why people are skeptical of wargaming, like how can we have generalizable conclusions from this? How can we understand what's a real conclusion or what's an artifact of idiosyncrasies in decision making? And so one of the real objectives for the Wargaming Working Group is to explore how it can be used as a methodology um, and to sort of demonstrate its potential as a methodology. And so sometimes that means uh, the Wargaming Working Group will have presentations from outside experts like Andrew Reddy or Tom Nagel. Um, sometimes um, that means we'll like run pretty basic operational war games in order to expose people who haven't been exposed to operational war gaming, like what an actual um, you know, tabletop exercise in that game looks like. Um, we're really fortunate that we've been able to run the game with MPS, and we're really excited that hopefully it becomes an annual tradition. Um, again, as a way to, to, to bridge um, you know, the ivory tower in Cambridge and the actual policy practitioners um, in uh, the Naval Postgraduate School and elsewhere. Um, so we're also like, and you know, when we do online events, we're, we're pretty excited to have people who aren't necessarily from MIT. So if you're curious about participating in these discussions, absolutely like send us an email afterwards. So another question that just came in is what types of careers do MIT Wargaming Group members go into besides DOD? Do any go into foreign service like uh, Department of State or the private sector? Do you know? Well, I think what I would say is sort of, I think most people who are in a PhD program are looking sort of to become people who will be civilian professors. I think that's sort of the major reason that people um, go to a PhD program that they want to teach either it be sort of in a traditional political science department, uh, public policy school, or sort of uh, professional military education. Um, sort of there are sort of alternative career paths coming out of a PhD program where you might sort of do more policy work. Um, but given that sort of um, the game, the sort of team, the Pacific Wargaming Working Group has only existed for about sort of two, a little over two years. Um, sort of, I don't know that we can sort of say that people who've been part of the group have gone on to have a specific type of career. 
Yeah, at, at this point, since we're, we're really only in our infancy in our third year, um, I think it's hard to see exactly where the pipeline leads, uh, hopefully to gainful employment for both me and Suzanne. Uh, but we, Someday, we, yes. we don't even we don't even know about that eventuality quite just yet. So on that tree note, I would like to follow up. What are things uh, what are career paths that you two are focused on or hoping for in the future after your Ph.D. program? Uh, a tough question there. <laughs> Uh, really put us on the spot. Especially with recorded answers, yeah. Oh, I, I hadn't even thought about the fact that it was recording. Now I have to watch my words. Um, no, but I think um, what I'd say is that, you know, I, I am very interested in sort of going on the academic job market after I, you know, complete the PhD. We're both, both Ben and I are at the, at the point in the program where we're starting our dissertations. Um, and we recognize though that the academic job market can is not always that forgiving and is sort of a difficult job market. And so I think that, you know, it's always important sort of to be realistic about what other career paths might be out there as well. I think it's it's difficult too, because even if you just separate it into the two things, whether you want to be in the policy field, um, like Suzanne and I were a bit before our PhD program or stay mainly in academia. It's difficult because I feel in the policy field, um, I think there's more of an assurance of immediate impact, especially if you're, you're working at an institution affiliated with the government, you're answering questions that you know, somebody wants answered because they're trying to make a decision. It's great to have that impact. Um, but the trade-off there is you have less command over the types of questions that you're able to ask um, because you're in generally a lot of the times following the wishes of a sponsor. Uh, in academia, I think ideally there's more freedom of research. Obviously that's one of like the highest priorities of academia. But there's not necessarily that assurance of policy impact. I mean, some of the discussions that we've had at MIT are like, hmm, like how does this research actually affect the policy world? Like how do policymakers like actually interact with conclusions about like in the field about like how civil wars operate, for example. Um, so that's a really long way for me to dodge answering the question. Um, I do think that one of the things that's really come up for me, especially through the Wargaming Working Group, is I really like being in an exciting group setting and I really enjoy the experience of teaching, which is not necessarily always emphasized in PhD programs. Um, but I think it would be really cool for my future career um, to eventually be in that type of scenario where I can still have exciting interactions uh, with folks like you, although hopefully um, less staring into a webcam and not <laughs> able to, to see or hear any of you. Yeah, but I would say I think one of the things that really animates me professionally is the opportunity to sort of do policy relevant research, which I think can be done from within academia or mm -hmm. obviously from within the policy world. Yeah, I think regardless of what you do, the most important thing is to ask questions that are interesting and that people care about. And that are important questions that sort of aren't just sort of talking into the void of other people um, who might not necessarily care about the issue. I see that uh, you still have the early optimism of a PhD candidate. Um, but, um, if you are, for those, for those who are out in the, in the audience, and if you are in a PhD program or in a master's program and you want to do war gaming, uh, come join us or come join me at the center for naval analysis. I'll plug my workplace, uh, and we do lots of games for the DOD and the rest of government. So, um, and you know, like I said, uh, me and Ben used to work at RAN together, uh, before he went off to the, to the North to do his PhD program. <laughs> um, so to sort of wrap up our questions, um, is, which we like to end with a particular question is if you had unlimited time and unlimited funding, right. If all roads just opened up to you, right. Uh, what is a wargaming project you would like to design lead or just sponsor yourself or think something that you would like to do? Um, I mean, that's a great question. I think I would sort of love like a week to sit and think about it. Um, but I guess for myself, what I think I would say is um, I'm really interested in my sort of own research and sort of modeling um, civilian intelligence relations sort of in terms of um, sort of civil military relations. And so it would be really interesting for me to work on a game sort of where there was the ability to model sort of civilian military intelligence dynamic. Um, in addition to just sort of a civil military dynamic. So you, you could imagine sort of a third side um, to each of these teams in this game that would provide sort of additional. Um, and then obviously sort of you would like to get individuals um, who are sort of intelligence officers uh, in you know, various countries to play in a game like that. Um, and sort of would that have different results of how people would behave um, or how people would learn. Um, 
Yeah, but I think that's that's a great question. I think I would, you ask any PhD student, what would you do with unlimited funding? Um, and I think their sort of eyes light up because they've never had unlimited funding in their life. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it is that is a tantalizing prospect to think about. Um, I think perhaps my first answer would be to to, to eat a little better. Um, but more seriously, in terms of the actual research question, I'm really interested in emerging technology. And one of the frustrating things in that space, especially, especially as it relates to artificial intelligence, is that people have very differing conceptions over what it will be. And there's a real lack of definitive information. A lot of the times, I feel like um, the AI community in general is, is, is sort of waiting around to see what actually happens, because there's not a lot definite to actually write about yet. Um, and so I'd love to have like a giant two-stage research design that first gathers um, tons of information from both uh, practitioners, technical experts, and military officers about potential applications of artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence may change the ways that wars are conducted, and then follow that up with a large iterated experimental design that varies different types of artificial intelligence enabled scenarios, um, and basically like looks at the total option space of what AI may develop into, um, and then looks at like basically um, by iterating through the scenarios, um, what do each of these worlds look like in terms of for how warfare is conducted and what it means to the application of military force in the diplomatic realm? Um, but yeah, the, the unlimited resources and time would definitely be a needed part of that particular project. Those are great uh, answers to a very difficult question. We like to spring that question on our, our speakers last minute. But I did notice a, a great question in the chat that I do not want to leave out is what does it take to set up a wargaming lab? Um, I'm asking as someone who has been attempting to do the same. I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I think the first thing that was really helpful for us is we had um, really great faculty sponsors who cared a lot about wargaming and wanted to work with us and were also able to help with the resource allocation. Um, so in our first year, particularly Eric Higginbotham and Dick Samuels, who were teaching the class, were really supportive of our efforts to set up a wargaming lab um, and really like helped us unlock some institutional resources, especially when you're at a large institution. It's unclear where the pots of money are located. And so it was really nice to have people who had been there for a while who helped us like access that. You know, I would also recommend finding yourself a teammate to set up sort of that wargaming, sort of set up a community of interest for wargaming. I think that if Ben or I were trying to run this group by ourselves, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible. Um, and sort of that in terms of that, then sort of working out from there, sort of once you have sort of your core group, then it's sort of finding other people who are interested and sort of thinking about how you advertise the experiences um, and trying to think sort of almost of a curriculum that you're thinking about uh, with your group. Yeah, definitely having a partner. Whenever there's a hard question tonight, I just paused long enough and Suzanne started answering it. So absolutely necessary to have someone to take the tough questions for you. Yeah, you could see the result of that, given how much better his uh, war game he was going to fund was. <laughs> I wanted to play his game instead of mine. So uh, I'll, I'll wait for a few minutes if there's any other last minute questions. But while I stall for any last minute questions, um, I want to thank both Suzanne and Ben for taking out uh, time out of their evening. Uh, to talk to us, uh, to the, both the wider, uh, wider wargaming community, but also here in, uh, at Georgetown. Um, it doesn't seem like we have any questions. So thank you again, Suzanne and Ben.